Pastor Charles is on leave, and so uh, volunteers are working uh, to provide a message and a service today. So we look forward to your attention and participation. And now we'll begin with the prelude. table in the hard work of life at the moments of ease in our day-to-day -day reality a time set aside like this time now for worship for listening for paying attention with every step we take goodness and mercy follow us our cups overflow
merciful God, the story of Jacob shows your willingness to enter into the messiness of our human struggles, into fractured relationships, family differences, unreconciled situations with people we care about. Yet we confess that too often we hold on because we do not want to loosen our grip on our possessions and our selfish desires. Often we fear that our very lives will be dislocated by your kingdom and values of justice, mercy, and peace. Help us to wrestle with the conflicting values, desires, and pressures that confront us daily so that we can unclench our hands and open ourselves to the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Only then can we fully embrace others in their pain and be embraced in the name of Christ. Amen. So welcome again, everybody. It's now the time for community prayer requests, concerns, and celebrations. So, anybody? Uh, please. I'm glad you know there are honest people in this world. I had lost a case with gift cards in it. We backtracked, couldn't find it, and finally Terry says, let's let me check at the movie theater. It had fallen out of my purse at the theater, and they had it, and all my gift cards were in there. So there are honest people. All we ever hear about are the bad ones. Amen to that. Pray for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out to this. 
<laughs> Other requests or concerns? If not, let's be in an attitude of prayer. Oops. Oh, why? Well, mine's kind of an afterthought, but since people have been sharing about unexpected food deeds, a week ago I was driving the girls back to Kremlin by myself, and as I was getting onto the on ramp for I 70, there was this horrible jolt in the car and this explosive boom. And I thought, well, these things happen, so I kept kind of driving. <laughs> The heavens are telling the glory of God, 
on the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course to its joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its seat. And now we have special music from the Jubilante Quartet. So the New Testament lesson is from Paul's epistle to the Colossians, chapter 1, verses 11 through 19. You can find this on page 200 of your pure Bibles. 
May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience, while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile himself to all things. God's blessing be on this reading about the cosmic Christ. Mm. <clears throat> so good morning to you all and may God's blessing be on this morning's message the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts as you know, during Pastor Charles Leaves, I'm sorry, during Pastor Charles Leaves, we're going to have some guest messages. And today I'm going to talk about one particular relationship between cosmology and theology. I'm drawing from a book on astrotheology and some others that I mentioned. And uh, I want to talk about the cosmic story. Sometimes this is called big history. You may have where it's academic discipline, even where history now integrates the history of the universe with the evolution of life, the rise of man, the evolution of humans, the history of the world, the rise of civilization, technology, and science. And often, though, in big history, uh, there's a question about you know, what is God's role in this cosmic story? I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So the big history, cosmic story, is the story of the universe, past, present, and future. And what's the connection of this cosmic story with religion, with spirituality, with God, with theology? And it's amazing, I'm amazed, that new findings in physics and astronomy, even in the last century, and even in the last decade, have a message that's theologically relevant. And this is it. The universe is evolving. It's a story. There's Darwin with the story of evolution. Hubble with the story of the expanding universe. Einstein with the idea of the cosmic, cosmological constant, the discoveries, the Earth-based telescopes of dark matter and dark energy which, although I can't explain them, not just because the sermon is too short, it, nobody knows the answer. To <laughs> and, and, but fortunately, they only make up three quarters of the universe. Oh. Oh. So what's the point? Uh, the point is, this is not anti-scriptural or anti-religious, but this new information says that the story of the universe, it's a drama. It's not static. It's not something that goes around and around again, cycles year after year, always the same. The universe is evolving, life is evolving, mm. and we're evolving too. So life itself and spirituality are an integral part of the design of the universe. How can I say that? The universe is designed to evolve. It has been for 14 billion years, and out of that evolution, come not just the stars and planets, but life on Earth, consciousness, intelligence, spirituality, 
And we're part of this evolution. We have the will to do things which are part, are becoming part of the story. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about the end, which is in the future. That's a slow and agonizing end, increasing isolation, inexorable decay, uh, uh, endlessly fading into oblivion. But there's hope still, so pay attention. <laughs> so faith joins physics and biology and astronomy to provide meaning to the story. So what is this cosmic story? No view graphs, no quiz, but let me just tell you briefly, uh, the universe began with a big bang 13.8 billion years ago. It was a really, really big bang. And we know from physics, thermodynamics, that everything cools off. And so the universe has been cooling down for 14 billion years. Now, of course, the first moments were unknown. We can't extrapolate backwards to that time because the physics we know is insufficient. And particularly, we can't reconcile the predictions of quantum mechanics with general relativity, the two biggest achievements of the 20th century in physics are uh, predicting different things for the origin of the universe and nobody knows the solution. It's very hard to do experiments with such a big bang, certainly not on a university campus. <laughs> so what happened first, we believe, in, within microseconds after the big bang, is the various physical forces differentiate. Light becomes different from gravity from the nuclear forces. And at that moment, the laws of nature evolved. There was no law that we know of now that we understand from current physics that applied before that time. But the laws of nature uh, evolve, and at that moment, the constants of nature are set. And some people think just randomly, just by chance. You might think, well, that's a good way to get rid of this problem. Others might say, that the constants of the universe are tuned up so that planets, stars, galaxies can evolve, and people who can worship uh, and think are you know, part of that original plan so that the coefficients, the constants of physics, were selected. And uh, I can't go into more details on maybe infinite times but you can hold the thought that at least where we are, everywhere we can see in the observable universe, it's pre-aligned for the development of life and eventually intelligence. So something called inflation happens, which is much worse than what we're trying to avoid in the current economy. Everything blows up, spans faster in the first second than the speed of light itself. And the universe expands to be bigger than a, a galaxy, from a tiny little speck, to bigger than a galaxy in about a second. And that inflation is somewhat non-uniform. It's not constant. It's not homogeneous. It's like you know, economic inflation it affects some people more than others. And that inflation left behind clumps, places that were more dense in places that were more vacuous. And these denser regions, eventually, billions of years after this second, are where the galaxies develop. And the less dense regions became the voids between the galaxies, which we can now see with the biggest telescopes and the network of galaxies and voids that fills all the space that we know. And as I said, thermodynamics says everything is cooling off. So originally, uh, this plasma, this ionized set of matter where everything is undifferentiated and expanding at a very uh, incredible pace, it starts to cool down. And as it cools down, first the nuclei and then atoms form from the hot plasma. And this Big Bang was incredibly productive, but it only made two elements in the universe, the two lightest elements, hydrogen and helium. Of course, they make up 90% of the universe, so that's still a pretty good deal. But all those other elements that you might notice that are essential 
for us in all forms of life, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, they were not made in the Big Bang. But where did they come from? We have to wait a little bit. The uh, galaxies emerge from their gravity, pulls them together, and in the galaxies, various spots are a little bit more dense, and that's where the first stars form. Of course, they have just hydrogen and helium, but they're nuclear furnaces. They burn the hydrogen like in an H-bomb. So the sun, which seems so pleasant and benign to us, is a million hydrogen bombs blowing off constantly. And as the hydrogen is burned, it is transforming the elements in the star, hydrogen and helium, into the heavier elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. And so the cosmic story in billions of years has started from something beyond our ken to galaxies, which we can still see, to stars, which are making elements in their interior. And then, how does this do us any good? The stars blow up. Each star has a life, and the life of the star ends many stars in an explosion. And there are two effects of that. One, it's very hot in the explosion, so hot that the nuclear furnace overheats and makes all sorts of elements, iron, uranium, nickel, phosphorus, sulfur, all those elements that are required for life are made in that explosion with the intense heat. And then the star blows up and spreads all those atoms to the neighboring part of the universe. So that first generation of stars naturally gives rise to a second generation. And this generation of stars, that second and of course the third, they have elements beyond hydrogen and helium. All the elements we know, including the elements that are essential, essential for life. Okay, so the stars form, they live, they die, they explode. They fill the galaxy with heavier elements. Yeah, these are the ones that provide the molecules for life on the planets around their stars. So an H-bomb in each star blows up, pollutes the gas cloud around the stars. They explode. New stars are formed with planets and moons and rings. And as I said, like a giant furnace, the elements that we need for life are manufactured and distributed. Carl Sagan said, we are star stuff. So we ourselves are made of not things that came from the Big Bang, but was made of stars. And there are quite a few of these stars. There are 200 billion stars in our own galaxy and 170 billion galaxies that we know of in the universe that we can see. So that's a lot of places where this is happening. And cosmic evolution is continuing, but let me just give you a picture so we have the Universe begins in the bang, big bang, expands, cools off, galaxies <coughs> form, stars, planets, moons, life, intelligence, consciousness, spirituality, and our own star, the sun, is about 4.6 billion years old, so a relative new newcomer. And in the history of the Earth, it was a, a billion years before the first life formed on the Earth maybe 3.7 billion years ago, and billions of years more before the first intelligence, or so we claim the first intelligent life appeared on Earth. And then the atoms have evolved into molecules. The molecules make cells. The cells evolve. The animals. The animals come and populate the sea and the land. Primates evolve. Our nearest relatives, monkeys and chimpanzees, then hominids, the first organisms, the first beings that are like us, and eventually humans who build cities and temples, form civilization, eventually its <coughs> history, which leads to philosophy and science. Not to mention religions, physics, astronomy, telescopes now explore the sky and spacecraft explore the planets. Mm. So John Hodd, a theologian, says, the immensity of the universe, our Sunday school image of God, 
now seems too small compared to the immensity of the universe. Well, does it? And if so, what should we do? But don't worry, the story continues. <coughs> now into the future. So this, the sun expands and uh, gets so big and hot and so luminous that the earth boils and is consumed in the sun. Don't worry, it's still about four billion years away. Uh, but wait, the story continues in the future. Uh, everything flies apart. There's a cosmic acceleration and expansion of the universe that was discovered just at the end of the 20th century. And in fact, not only are things flying apart, they're flying apart faster and faster. And this brings to mind Einstein's idea of the cosmological constant, which he has as a fudge factor in one of his equations. But it turns out, he, he said it was his greatest blunder, but it turns out there actually is a cosmic, cosmological constant and it's causing the universe to expand. So the galaxies are flying away from each other. Uh, the stars cool off and die. So is this a tale of sound and fury signifying nothing? This heat death of the universe is one possibility, but another uh, is anticipation of some sort of advent. And that is, since the universe is evolving, we can't predict what's happening. We humans are fully embedded in nature. Our story, evolution, intelligence, spirituality, is part of the evolution of our whole universe and fits within it. So it's a key point. The universe is evolving. Each moment is leading to the next. The details and even the direction and outcome are contingent. They depend on what's happening. It's unpredictable and it's dramatic. It's a drama. So the cosmic story is not a story that repeats every year or every century or every millennium. It's a story that's open, that God only knows, or perhaps God is engaged in this cosmic experiment where he seated it and he with us is coming to its fulfillment. So where is God in the cosmic story? I believe that God is the author of all. So. This is a good answer, but not the first answer on my list. So hold that thought. Oh. <laughs> the first answer is nowhere. God's nowhere in this. You know, if we have rationality and pure science and reduce everything to the smallest elements, so we reduce all intelligence to biology, all biology to chemistry, all chemistry to physics which we understand that there's no role for God in this. He's nowhere. On the other hand, uh, he could be at the beginning That's right. of the universe. He could be the person who threw the switch, or like Richard Dawkins said, he could be the blind watchmaker, the blind person who makes a watch, and the watch just keeps ticking. So we think it goes back to Isaac Newton, one of the great physicists, the universe is suddenly ticking. Watch. It's been wound up by God, and he's set back and just watching the sentence for the body. Okay, then there's Belinda's point, which is, you know, God is at the beginning, but he's also everywhere as the universe evolves, and also at the conclusion. Even this conclusion that seems a little bit depressing. And I'd like to say, echo, that God is the author of the cosmic story. So Dennis Sober, the uh, science columnist from the New York Times, says, modern si science suggests that we and all our achievements are, vanished, are destined to vanish like a dream. And in 1998, the cosmic expansion was discovered to be speeding up, and dark energy pushes everything apart. And the cosmological constant, Einstein's fudge factor, is now driving the history universe is not really history, it's what we predict. And Sabina Hofstetter says in existential physics, that we actually can't predict quite everything, but based on our current predictions, uh, the universe will cool off and vanish, and 
become totally lifeless in about 100 million years. So that's still after, after you know, after the service and after the surgery. <laughs> so so uh, what comes over me to say he's, he's a science journalist, but he says, concentrate on the magic of the moment. It's a long way off, 200, million, 200 billion years. And I say, be part of the future. It's not my own idea. Theologians like uh, Taylor and Michelle have said that the universe is evolving and we're all approaching a point in the future which is imagined but not known yet. Mm -hmm. And this takes us back to our epistle about the cosmic Christ, the, that God was there at the beginning. He's part of the universe. He's not sitting away watching the universe click uh, to the seconds away. And we can be part of the future. We can all play our role in the drama. And no one knows the end. That's actually said. Even the best physics can't predict the end 200 billion years ago, especially since within the last 20 years, our total picture of the universe has changed. So it might well change again in the next 200 billion years. So St. Paul talks about the cosmic Christ in Colossians. Abraham had faith. He left his home and he had faith in the future. And Jesus calls us to be part of the kingdom. And we can participate in the fulfillment of the universe. So that's the message. Here's the conclusion. The universe is not static. It's evolving. It's a drama. The universe has taken a long time to evolve to the current state. It wasn't created in a flash. It wasn't created in seven days unless we imagine them to be eras of millions of billions of years. And we can thank some scientists, Darwin, Einstein, Hubble, and others for our current understanding. So the interaction between science and theology is not that they're separate, or not even that uh, occasionally some scientific results can affect theology, like I've been talking about. But also, theology, spirituality, can affect our scientific understanding. So, have faith. Take your role. In, take your role in the drama, drama. Take your own role, and anticipate the eventual fulfillment of the kingdom in our universe. So, let me just you know quote from uh, Professor Albert in the Puzzle of the Universe about the future of the universe. The universe expands ever faster. The galaxies become so distant they are invisible. We can't even see the nearest stars. Everything will be dark and empty. The universe cools off. The black holes dim. The stars burn out. The universe is transformed into an uninhabitable region without life. But it's still a long time away. Here and now, it's high time to concentrate and to take better care of our planet and to anticipate and participate in the eventual fulfillment of our kingdom. Thank you for your attention. Amen. Amen. So our next activity is uh, communion. And Reverend Dan Daniels is going to come up and lead us in that. <laughs>
It's too small. I don't know how it relates to what you talked about, Larry, but to me, what you said was important uh, because it related, it related in my mind to those religious or, or theological uh, concepts. I called our son a couple of days ago and because I'm old and I can't see and I can't do a lot of things and I haven't, I haven't been in the parish for a long time and he was a district superintendent so I called him and said, John, what do I need to do? What's required by the discipline to have communion? And he's probably more of a maverick than I am and he said, bless the elements and distribute them. <laughs> I would go a little further than that, but not too far. Near the end of his ministry, uh, Jesus, of course, sat down with his disciples for the Passover meal, celebration of the Passover. And uh, during this time with his disciples and surrounding this time, one of them betrayed him, one did not know him, and they all ran away. And I wonder in my heart, what would, what, why was he blessing this ragtag outfit that didn't even, wasn't even totally loyal to him? All well, this occurred during the celebration of the Passover, so we can reflect that the saving act of God in Egypt and during the Passover maybe in some respects is really related to the saving act of Christ in the crucifixion resurrection. Well, let's proceed with parts of the ritual. And uh, you have your books, I hope, open to 15. Thank you. You can read along with me with these most of this, if not all. And so the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. And lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and grace. It is right and a good and joyful thing. Always and everywhere give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. And when we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God and spoke to us through the prophets. And so with your people on earth, and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, ate with sinners, by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church and delivered us from slavery to sin and death, made us with a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and the Holy Spirit.
they, the elements will be distributed by Ben and Larry, which to me is the most big triangle between country and members of the youth and members of the congregation. And so we will continue the ritual and then they will come forth with the elements and distribute them to you. On the night when he was betrayed, when he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread. And he gave thanks to God for the bread. And then he gave it to his disciples and eat of this will fall. For this represents my body, which is broken for me. After supper, he took a cup, and lifting it, he blessed the cup. And he said to his disciples, this cup represents my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you can in remembrance of me. Is there a connection between the blood of Christ and the Passover and the sin of the disciples as they left? I think so. I think I got this memorized after 62 years. Supper had been over and the elements had been shared with the disciples. We say, as we reflect on that, and so the remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, through them we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory be yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. The table is set, and Steve will wait on you as you come forward. If there are those that would like to be served with the place, uh, we would be glad to bring it to you. And uh, there is the uh, gluten-free bread here, and the path from trays home The table is ready.
So now, please stand and join in the final hymn. This is my Father's Word, number 144. <clears throat> Thank you. 
So now, may the peace that passes all understanding be with you and us until we meet again. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Yeah. <laughs>